Opening debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll be splitting my time with the member from Etobicoke North. Mr. Speaker, there's no doubt that every member in this House is committed to the safety of their constituents, our communities, and our nation. The framers of our Constitution knew from the start that peace and order is essential for good government. That said, evidence-based laws are key to peace and order. And sadly, for all their focus on crime and punishment, this government lacks the evidence to support their legislation. With pieces of this legislation having reached committee stage before, members of this House are fully aware that evidence given at committee completely contradicts the Conservative preoccupation with heavy minimum sentences. I've talked to the Chief of Police in Guelph, to prosecutors, to correctional officers and criminologists. We've read countless evidence-based reports and statistics, and the jury is in. Based on all the evidence, these experts have come to the same conclusion. In order to be tough on crime, we must first be smart on crime. Locking up everyone is not a smart solution. It makes us dumber on crime. There are a good number of things that prisons are not. They are not a place where skills are developed. They are not addiction treatment centers. They do not combat the scourge of mental illness, and they provide little or no treatment options. A jail cell doesn't even provide support to victims, except to give them the satisfaction of retribution. Smart on crime means that instead of spending $108,000 a year on each and every additional criminal the government insists on incarcerating, that money could go to drug treatment programs in my riding, like Stonehenge. Stonehenge was established 40 years ago. Through the dedication of its staff, managers and donors, this program helps to restore hope and dignity to those afflicted by addiction, restores lives and livelihoods so that those suffering from substance addiction can once again feel a sense of relevance and dignity and be productive and successful members of our society. Clients at Stonehenge are from the general public or are people in conflict with the law, diverted to Stonehenge in Guelph for drug treatment. Imagine for a moment how many people could be treated using the 108,000 annual sp a sum spent on incarcerating a single person suffering from an addiction, a terrible disease. Smart on crime means de developing and funding programs that reduce poverty, that create jobs, and that tackle mental health issues. Jails under this government have turned into public housing for individuals with addictions or mental health issues. Smart on crime means not increasing the rate of recidivism. Even before this bill was tabled, there are prisons in Canada at 200% capacity. If overcrowding is shown to lead to more crime, there is no way anyone on the other side can argue that increasing the number of Canadians incarcerated will be a deterrent or cut down on the crime rate. What of the costs? This government refused to disclose the costs in the last parliament and was found in contempt of this great institution. Despite the hundreds of pages the Minister of Justice cited yesterday uh, that were provided to Parliament, he purposely evaded every single question put to him about the cost of this legislation. Applying 2009 forecasts, the total cost to the federal and provincial governments by 2016 will be over $18 billion. Meanwhile, this government hasn't consulted with the provinces on the additional financial burden they will now shoulder. Mr. Speaker, mandatory minimum sentencing is already considered a failed policy in the United States, a nation with an incarceration rate 700 percent higher than ours per capita. It is illogical for this government to go down this path to satisfy ideological urges. Even in the United States, lawmakers are moving away from the lock them up and throw away the key mentality that created mega prisons that became crime factories. Experts in the United States came late to the realization that they were spending more on incarcerating citizens than enrolling them in post-secondary education. As a young lawyer, it fell to me on a couple of occasions to defend one client or another who had on a lark or suffering from mental illness or depression committed a nonviolent offense. Remorseful and entirely aware of the impact of their actions and how wrong they were, the judge granted a conditional discharge. Without the stigma of a criminal record or in some cases 
possible incarceration, these clients were then able to gain admission to university, keep or get a good job, travel across the border, and ultimately become a successful, contributing member of society they otherwise might not have. We must trust our legal professionals, our judges, prosecutors, and police and corrections officers to exercise their judgment on a daily basis. They deal with the law up close and personal. Who are we to presume to know better than them when someone deserves treatment options or diversion from incarceration? A second chance, an opportunity to make something better of themselves, to kick a drug habit, to deal with mental illness, to work in the community and develop skills that will lead to stable employment and a fulfilling life. Criminal justice is about so much more than just throwing people in jail. It's about recognizing people's circumstances and building programs to help them cope, adjust and manage those things that may otherwise lead to criminal activity. For all of their talk about victims and the terrible cost borne by the victims of crime, this bill is absent any provision to help them. There is nothing in this bill that deals with the numbers members opposite continue to throw around. Victims cannot be compensated through retribution. An eye for an eye doesn't make up for a wrong done. Crime is at its lowest rate in nearly 40 years, yet this government is willing to turn around nearly two generations of decreasing crime rates out of fear and fiction instead of facts, ideology instead of evidence. My colleague, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, put it very succinctly yesterday when he said this bill is really an act. It is cosmetic window dressing, rhetoric that is sound and fury but little action to address the real problem at its source. Investing unnecessary billions of dollars on building unnecessary prisons while crime is receding instead of investing on crime prevention, social housing, employment assistance, health care, and child care, which will create more crime than justice. Throughout my career as a lawyer, and now into my career as a legislator and a representative of my community, I have reviewed the law as a tool to advance the issue of social justice whenever possible. While engaged on the Committee Against Family Violence and Women in Crisis, or the Wellington Guelph Housing Authority on great projects like Onward Willow Better Beginnings, Better Futures, or changing Guelph's police response to violence between spouses and changing court sentencing for offenders by ensuring their enrollment in anger management programs, not incarceration, I gained a deeper understanding of the complexities surrounding justice issues. My community of Guelph is a compassionate one. We are top five in Canada for education, number one per capita for volunteerism, and have an incredibly professional police force. The engagement and care for at-risk members of our community is responsible for Guelph being the safest city in Canada, as identified by Statistics Canada. Public safety and crime can be a divisive political issue, but it doesn't need to be so long as we listen to the facts and heed our expert evidence. We have an opportunity to be smart on crime and not pass this omnibus bill in its present form. We don't need to completely ignore painfully learned and carefully documented and researched lessons by treating crime as a black and white issue. There is no strong or weak on crime. That is ideological language used to divide, to promote misinformation based on fear, anger, and misplaced need for revenge. If more and longer sentences were the answer to increasing public safety, the United States would be the safest country in the world. And it is far from that, Mr. Speaker. Instead, even the most conservative U.S. lawmakers are now turning away from their old approach. Well, we went ahead on into it. I implore this government not to continue on this reckless, reckless path. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member. But I want to thank uh, the member for his question. I have a great deal of respect for him. I wish the question had been placed this way. Are there any provisions of the legislation that I agree with? And yes, Mr. Speaker, I would have said there are provisions in this uh, legislation that I agree with. Sexual predators are one of those sections that I happen to agree with. Perhaps 
a trafficker trafficking at a school to children might be one of those sections that I agree with. Uh, luring children is a section that I agree with. What I disagree with is the illogical commitment to absolute minimum sentences in all circumstances where you take away the discretion of a judge, a lawyer, a Crown attorney, a probation officer who's prepared a pre-sentence report, and they say, perhaps in a, a minor incident of uh, a possession of marijuana plants, look, there's a better solution than to throwing this fella in jail. The solution is going to a treatment program like that offered at Stonehenge because they can be rehabilitated there rather than criminalized by being put in jail. Uh, questions? I thank my honorable friend for the question, and that is precisely, you've hit the nail on the head. By passing this legislation, in many respects, it will remove the discretion of judges in the courts to be able to look at circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis. It is a sad society when every single person is painted with the same brush, given no opportunity to explain the circumstances from which they come, given no opportunity to rehabilitation, which is not found uh, in our jails, given no opportunity to pursue a meaningful life because of the criminalization that they will face because they've not been, if by being put in jail, because they've not been given the opportunity to attend a mental health treatment program that may have led in that case, perhaps because of a depression that they were suffering from momentarily uh, th that led to that particular offense and they have no opportunity to receive treatment for it. Or as I said earlier, drug treatment or any other incidents that may be appropriate under the circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, before we resume debate,